Okay, good question. So uh, you mentioned a tube, right? So I can create a tube on here and I'll just make a tall. And there's the inside diameter and the outside. And then let's pan here. Okay, so I have this tube here and I want to bend it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, an easy way to do that is to uh, go to the modify panel and add a bend modifier to it, right? And so there's a list of a whole slew of things you can do to these things, right? So bend is one of them, and then I can just specify the angle. There you go. And you can animate that. So you can have it flop around like a gas station thing. <laughs> I don't know what they're called, so I shouldn't have mentioned it. Anyway, um, the other thing is if I go back to here and increase the number of um, height segments, I can get a smoother bend out of it. See how that works? Right, so with fewer, with one, it doesn't look like it's bent at all, right? So it just kind of rotates the top and bottom parts. So the one bend, see how it, and that is the internal structure of all these 3D objects is really just straight lines. There's no bent lines in this thing, right? Everything's a straight line. Everything's a, a four-sided or three-sided face, pretty much. So. Actually, everything's a three-sided face, as it turns out. So anyway, does that that more or less answers the question? Is that as far as yeah, you okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll go into that further. We'll talk about modifiers. Like, there's a lot of them in there, and they do fun things. So it'll be good. All right, so we left off yesterday uh, with a plane on the ground. I can use the top view to drag that plane. Good thing that view cube's not there. And it, there's a green surface, I guess. And then the sphere. And I'll make a sphere. Now the sphere is halfway in the ground, so but that's okay. Uh, don't care at this point because I'm going to set up my scene now. To uh, so I'm going to use my front view. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and Alt W. Do you remember? Alt W allows me to maximize and minimize the the screen. Right, so I can go back from four to one, four to one, maximize, minimize, whatever your your viewports. So that's Alt W. It's a good one to remember. If you don't remember, uh, you can come back down here, and it tells you. Right, so in the very lowest right corner of your uh, interface, right, there's the navigation controls, zoom controls, and stuff. The lower right corner one does that for you, right? So, and if you hover over it, it tells you the keyboard shortcut for it. So, there you go enough all right so i don't know how you want to you know plan this bouncing ball but i'll just go ahead and uh, get w on the keyboard against my move tool and i'm going to move the ball right there's several ways you can move i do want to talk about these tools as we use them because we'll be building upon that throughout the course right so the gizmo which you can um resize with your plus and minus keys right next to the backspace key and you don't have to hit the shift minus or that's oh, just or the shift plus. I mean, it's just equals whatever that is. So I can make it smaller or bigger. Sometimes it's nice to get that thing out of the way. Sometimes you need it bigger, whatever. So if I click, so if I hover my mouse over some of these, uh, like, like the Y. So if I click that, notice now that the red X uh, axis is now just red. It's not yellow. Yellow is highlighted. So if I click on that ball and I move it, no matter what I do with my mouse, it'll only move up and down in this view, right? Which is the Y direction. Well, it's actually the Z direction, but that's another story that we'll get to. So um, I click on the X and then move it, and then it'll only move in the X direction. So those are constraints. Those constraints are really useful if you want to constrain it. <laughs> And there are reasons to do that. So, um, but it, the square in the middle, if I click that and, and drag it, see, I don't even have to have my cursor on the ball. I can just move, click on that axis, or in this case, that double axis or the plane, I can move it in the XY plane in this view. And I'm gonna put it up. Let me zoom out just a little bit more. Now, this is all about scale now. So if I zoom way out, I mean, I made the floor really big, but if I zoom way out, the animation is going to make the ball look like a ping pong ball instead of a beach ball or something. So 
depends on the scale of your scene on what you what you want to do. But anyway, anyway, let's leave it like this. I don't know what that scale is going to look like, and I'll adjust it later. Okay, this is my this is how I want to start. So this would be my start frame for my animation. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead now um, introduce some animation basics of this. Um, I have a timeline down here. And so this is how to manage the timeline. Uh, 3ds Max will, and you're probably familiar, uh, have you taken an animation course at all, like the 2D animation? I used to teach that, it was pretty fun. Anyway, uh, Blender has a 2D animation tools too. You've played with that. Anyway, um, basically you, you're the one that sets up the major scenes, like what are called keyframes, right? And it used to be when everything was handmade that the, the senior animators set up the keyframes and told the story. And the junior animators, they did their apprenticeships by filling in, getting that ball from one place to another, right? So all we have to do here is specify the time, right? So let's say I wanna take 10 frames. So I slide my time to 10. Now I gotta turn on the animation. So N on the keyboard for animation is how you turn it on, or you can just click on that auto button. See, we're down there. And red tells you you're in animation mode, right? So that's going to record your keyframes for you. Okay, so nothing's recorded yet because I haven't done anything. I've just set up my front scene and I'm gonna move. Now I've slid my time to 10, and now I get to move the ball to the floor, right? Line it up with the floor, keep it there. It's all good. Now you notice uh, at zero and 10, if you slide your um, scrubber, right, your time slider, this is called scrubbing your time, right? There's no animation going past 10, but from here to here, it already did it, right? So those apprentices have already filled in the keyframes between the keyframes, right? They're all, they were also called tweeners for in-betweens, oh. right? They call them tweeners. Anyway, so, so now it's on the floor. So another 10 frames elapses and it bounces back up, but maybe not as high, right? So see, all I got to do is scrub forward, make a move, put it back on the floor, make a move, pick it up, slide, get the, get the feel for this, try it. And I'll um, pause the recording and we'll look around and make sure we're all happy with what, with how it's going. So I don't know if I got, see that bounced higher than the last one. So I just, <laughs> that, that doesn't make physical sense. So even these, that one's, that one's higher and that one. Okay. That's probably pretty good. It doesn't look right yet, but I'll, um, we'll fix it. So let's pause. Uh, another question um, is uh, was good is uh, about keyframes. Now I stopped at 60 and I only had like a couple bounces, right? So what if you wanted to go on and do more elaborate things? Well, you can click on this little time configuration or really just right click on any of these player controls, but that time configuration box, you can just specify, in my case, I just want to go to 60, but if you wanted to go to like 300 or whatever, just realize you're running at three, 30 frames a second, right? So each of my movements here, like every 10 frames is a third of a second. So, but, but typically animators will think in terms of frame instead of time or seconds anyway, but whatever, um, in this case, we're good. So I'm going to put mine at 60. Um, if I wanted to go to put it at 600, then there I go, right? So now I have 600 frames to work with. So you can scale these animations all day long, right? So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I scrub through the, who was that? If I scrub through my animation and I take a closer look at what's going on here, um, see how it kind of swoops in? That's called your easing, right? So it's it's trying to slow the ball down before it gets to the keyframe, and it's speeding it up as it comes out. Well, that's you know that's okay at the tops of the bounces, like right here, nice arc there. But when it hits the floor, it should just bounce right up instead of kind of slide in, right? 
So we're going to fix that. With the ball still selected, I can turn off my auto key. I don't need auto key on right now. I've kind of done setting my keyframes and such. Then I can go to graph editors and go to the curve editor. So I can edit the curve or the, well, really the movement or the motion of this ball, right? So curve editor, make this a little bigger so you can see. Now, I don't know if anybody's watching. Yeah, probably not. I don't know if that will share that screen. So maybe a new share and screen. Yeah, that might work. Anyway, so I can see, well, the X, Y, and Z axes, and I see the animation for each one of those. So every time I added a keyframe, it added a keyframe for the motion in each direction, in each X, Y, and Z. Now remember, X, Y, and Z and RGB are together, right? So the red is the X, the Y is the green, Z is the blue. So really, it's just the up-down motion that I'm concerned with. So I'm just going to click on Z, get rid of the other ones. And yeah, so that should be fine. The Y is just straight. I didn't move it left or right. I just, well, I didn't move it in or out, I guess. But anyway, so I can leave that alone. So this is the problem right here. These three keyframes right here. I need to adjust those. So I'll start with the big one. Um, I want to move. So this is just like, what is, uh, what do you call those things? Anchor points, right? So here's the, the keyframe is like a Bezier curve. You guys familiar with Bezier, the pen tool in Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever? Anyway, the anchor point is the vertex basically. And then you can drag, you can move the, well, I still have a move tool up here, right? So move keys. I can move the key uh, up and down, but see, it's trying to keep it smooth. So that's not good, right? So I'm going to tap my right mouse button, get it back. And this time I'm gonna hold the shift key down while I do it. And that breaks it and changes it to a Bezier corner. And that's what I want. So shift, drag those whiskers or the control handles or anchor point handles or whatever you call them. And once you do that, once they're black in color, you can see they're, they're a different kind of curve, right? So shift, drag, and then I can let go of my shift key. See left hand, no, no doing anything. So. And what I'm trying to do is make this curve a nice parabola because that's how the ball bounces. All right, so I think this is a little short, so I'm gonna lengthen that out and stuff. So I'm gonna try to make these curves nice and so questions. I see a hand up. Uh, oh, okay. Um is it docked somewhere? Okay, yeah, let's let's try to figure that out. Um, let me pause here. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's looking good. Looks only good. Um, so I can't really tell. I mean, I I like the the curvature. It looks pretty smooth to me, and nice little V's at the bottom. So um, test it, right? So I can close that. Um, I'm still not in animation mode, but I don't need to be, so I can just scrub through my frame. And now it certainly looks more bouncy. Boing, 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 right? Looks good, except the beginning. See how that ball kind of shoots towards the floor instead of kind of was lobbed? So I might want to edit that. Come on. Yeah, this frame right there, stretch that out just a bit more, maybe not too much. Okay, should be good, should be good. A Little bit better, okay. Let's say that's good enough and let's move on. Okay, so now that we've, so that's, uh, we'll have a whole section, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time animating. There's lots and lots of tools for animation. But this is the basics of it, right? It's just a very quick, this is a quick start, right? So we're going to go on. Um, probably should save at this point, right? So I'm going to file and save. Oh, yeah, I didn't name it yet. Probably put it. Yeah. 
Where are my documents? There you go. We'll just put it in here. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to zoom out of my perspective view a little bit, and I want to take a look at what's going on. Um, so if I scrub through the time, it looks like, yeah, that's pretty good. And I'll pick a nice camera angle shortly, but uh, I want to deal with like textures, right? So I have this green floor. Uh, maybe I want the floor to look like something. So um, let's let's add materials to these objects, these two objects here. So um, there's a material editor that we want to look at. And it's right next to the three teapots is the material editor. What do you think the keyboard shortcut for material editor is? Yeah, you can see right there, it's M, right? So M turns that on. So it's a node-based material editor. That means you can connect uh, the, the material to the object in a variety of ways, but let's just go with a general, I'm gonna start with just a, a, a plain Jane physical material. So I drag that out into my uh, viewport here this in the editor. And um, do I have the ball selected? I do. So this is gonna be my ball material. So I'm gonna rename it. On the right are my parameters, right? So I'm gonna name it ball mat, ball material. Sorry. And likewise, I'm going to add another one. And I'll name that floor mat. <laughs> okay, so now I have two materials, one for the floor, one for the ball. So since the ball is selected, I can just select that material, right click its title, and assign the material, assign material to selection, right? Since in the scene, the ball is selected, that should add. The, the there it is. So I can see that the ball is now gray and I can change since this is the selected material, I could change its color in the base color and reflections part of it. So let's try a magenta color or something. Let's see if that changed it. Yep. So you can see that. Some of the other um, parameters that you might want to play with. Don't want to dig in too much to this, but if I wanted a shiny ball, I would set its, um, well, I would set its metalness to, actually, I'll go to advanced here, and up the reflections. Well, the reflections go from zero to one, so it's as shiny as it's going to get. So maybe I want to knock that down a little bit, maybe half that much, and maybe make its roughness a little bit more, so it's uh, 0.3 or something. So. Um, the, it's not quite as shiny, right? So maybe this is a rubber ball. Now, if you don't want to mess with all that, I, there are some presets, and I think there's a rubber in here too. So there's metals. There's a rubber material, right? And then I can change the color of that rubber to my um, kind of a magenta kind of color. Good enough, right? So there's a magenta rubber ball. So I can see now that the ball hardly is shiny at all, right? And so the reflections are, by the default, that preset has the reflections at 0.59. Well, that's pretty much what I had it at. And the roughness is all the way to uh, one instead of 0.3 like I had it. So yeah, if I wanted to make it a little slightly shinier ball, I might you know, knock that up a little bit. There we go. So. You can make it transparent and do some other things with it, but we'll just leave it like it is. So that's nice. Would you apply it? Um, okay, yeah. As long as the ball is selected, you can just right click on the material itself and assign the material to the selection. Here's another way to do it. I'll do that with the floor. Okay, so I can make the, yeah, it kind of wants to be big, but I'll just make it a little smaller and I'll pan over and see the output node. I can just drag that output node onto the floor. So you can do it that way too, right? Okay, so, and then I select it and let's go with, I don't know, what do we got? Masonry? Ooh, yeah, okay. I might be able to work with that, I guess. That's more like for a wall. 
but uh, I, I'll see what, see what we can do with this. Um, um, it's also very big, right? Those are very big bricks. Um, so perhaps I would want to go to these uh, two maps. These are images that are being used to display the, the surface of this floor, right? So if I click on it, I could set the tiling a little bit higher, maybe go to five in the X and Y direction or the UV direction. So U and V is just like X and Y, but local for the object itself. So, so just doing that, you'll notice that the bumps um, are now off. The bumps are the same size, but the bricks are now a lot better. So I need to go back to the bump channel. See, I can see the bump map. The, a map is just a two-dimensional image, right? A two, just an image, right? So I click on that and go set these at five also. And now my bumps and the bricks match again. Is that okay? That looks horrible, but whatever. I'll, I'll just keep it. Yeah, maybe if I zoom out, I'll look better. That might look okay, I guess. Okay, good enough, good enough. Is that all right so far? Let's try that. I'll pause and we'll answer questions as needed. Okay, so uh, now that I have this, uh, I also kind of want to talk about background, right? So I'm going to add a light to my scene. Now, lights have to match the materials. They have to, like, the materials have to reflect the light, right? So they have to be compatible. Not all materials are compatible with all the lights and stuff, and neither is the renderer. So I kind of want to talk about rendering just real quick here. Rendering is the process of getting the output, right? So this 3D scene, you can't really share with anybody unless they have 3ds Max also. And it's like a $3,000 program or whatever, so not everybody has it. <laughs> but most people have like a phone that can show videos or whatever, right? So you basically end up outputting. So rendering is the process of outputting, right? So um, F10 will open up your render setup or go to render. Um, also, you can click on this teapot with the gear on it and that'll open up your render setup. So the only thing I wanna show in here right now is the Arnold renderer, right? So that is, you have some other ones, uh, more like the scanline renderer is the first one 3ds Max that we came out with. It's probably the fastest one, but it's also the ugliest. <laughs> Arnold renderer is the default one. The art renderer, the Autodesk Ray Tracer is a more accurate one. Uh, the Arnold is kind of a uh, fast and accurate. The art render is more for like architectural renderings and stuff, but um, we can play with all those when we get to talking about rendering, right? Okay, so we'll get there. But anyway, with that Arnold renderer, you have to add an Arnold light, right? So in the create panel, I'm gonna click on that light bulb and it has photometric lights, but I, I'm gonna go to Arnold lights and there's just an Arnold light, right? So click on that, add one to the scene. It puts it on the floor. Now I could have used maybe the front view to put it above the floor, but I can just move it. Kind of want to move it above everything. So let's, so I can't really tell how that light's affecting anything, right? Um, but I can do test renders, right? So I can just render this and produce a still shot, right? So um, so I'll click on that teapot with the lightning bolt on it. It'll take me a minute. Uh, obviously, that light is not bright enough. I can barely see that. In fact, I can't see it. <laughs> yeah. So let's up the value for that light, right? So um, in the modify panel, I just want to look at the intensity, right? So here's the intensity right there. And it's at one. So let's go 10. And zoom back in, render. All right, all right. So not good enough. Let's go a thousand. 
I might need to see some exposure settings for that matter. Okay, now I can start seeing stuff. And, and the problem here is these are physically correct kind of lights. So the reason that one wasn't good enough is maybe I just made the floor way too big and the balls way too far. And things are just, the light is relatively just super tiny, like a, like a, a match in a universe or something. I don't know. Um, but if I, yeah, there it is. So at least I can see it now. <laughs> Um, and if I click on the plane, let's just take a look at it. Yeah, my plane's a thousand by two thousand, so the light was just too small and too far away to shine onto the floor and such. So, so there you go. How did you get that panel underneath the um, display? Oh yeah, um, let me zoom out. So I select the light, um, and this stuff isn't doesn't look the same. So see where I went to the modify panel. So click on the word modify. It's right next to the plus. Then you get all the parameters for that light. So good question. Uh, maybe I could scale the scene down a little bit. Um, that light still wasn't very bright. So I'm going to go back to all four viewports and maybe use the top viewport. And I'm going to hold the shift key down and move the light. Maybe make a couple of these. If you hold the shift key and move, it makes a copy, right? So I can make a couple lights. I bet that's a lot brighter. Let's see. So I'll zoom back in and render that view again. All right, so now I can see the ball, the front of the ball, side of the ball kind of stuff. So usually even photo studios use uh, triangle lighting. So they'll have a key light that, that, light, that illuminates your main focus. We'll have a backlight to uh, give it contrast, and then I'll have a side light or a fill light to fill that up. But we'll talk about lighting and stuff more later too. So um, this is fine for now. The only problem I don't think, you know, I don't like my textures and stuff, but also this black background, it's like you're floating in space and you are, there's, there's nothing else besides this floor and the ball. So um, a couple other things that we'll do, I know we're running out of time. Um, I just want to talk about backgrounds, right? So we could fill that background with a different color or uh, another material. So I just want to show you that real quick, and then we'll save and be done today. So, so I'll close that. I'll hit 8 on the keyboard, which is the same thing as going to, I don't know where it is, actually, uh, rendering. And I go to environment. See the 8? So under the environment, I can just change. See that color swatch? I just click on that color and change the background, right? So a dull blue should work. Not really saturated. Okay, let's render that. That looks a little better and that fills up the light. So I probably didn't need as much light because I didn't have any. And you'll notice also that that color is bleeding into my texture. See, now the floor looks kind of blue it's because it's reflecting the blue background. Okay, one other thing, I got three minutes. Is that all right, though? Any questions? Uh, see something again? Yeah, yep, yep. Because it's very reflective. Yeah. So you can adjust your reflections and stuff, but there's other things you can do. You can do HDRI um, maps for your backgrounds and stuff, it looks really great. So mm -hmm. anyway, we'll we'll do that too. So um, yeah, what do I wanna do? Oh, um, I wanna use, this is where you could put an HDRI, you can put it on an environment map, right? Well, you know, I could use the material editor in conjunction with this. Hello, there we go. Put these next to each other. And I can look for um, some maps. So I scroll down. And here are some maps here. I probably don't want to use these OSL lights, but how about just a simple gradient? So I'll drag a gradient into my screen. Let's put it over here. This gradient just uses three colors. So I can copy that color. That's going to be my main color, copy. And then maybe a little there. I'll just make three colors here. That's not a great color for a sky. What am I thinking? Okay. Okay. 
there that gradient, and then I can drag its output on top of the environment map where it says none and instance, which means that whatever changes I make here will happen to that map. If I make a copy, then that won't happen. So instance is great for changing the parameters in the material editor and having it happen in the environment. There you go. So now I have this other environment. It looks a little better, maybe. So there you go. OK, um, let's stop here. Um, the other things I want to do with this is um, set up the shadows, make sure the shadows are OK, and add sound, right? So when the ball hits the floor, it does something, right? So we have some sound with it. And maybe even putting some walls up or making the background a little more appealing. But anyway, um, that should do it. And then we'll, then we'll do the rendering. So that's, that's all we have left with this. So um, that's it for today anyway. I'll stop that.